This week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about teeny tiny routers, and Patrick Jean of OutSystems is here to talk about low code development. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twit. This week in Enterprise Tech, episode 508, recorded August 26, 2022, the death of DevOps. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by userway.org. UserWay is the world's number one accessibility solution and is committed to enabling the fundamental human right of digital accessibility for everyone. When you're ready to make your site compliant, deciding which solution to use is an easy choice to make. Go to userway.org slash twit with 30% off UserWay's AI powered accessibility solution. And by Thinks Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how do you hear about us box. And by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. Hosted by Bridget Todd, this season of IRL looks at AI in real life. Search for IRL in your podcast player. Welcome to Twiat, this week in enterprise tech, your home for all the latest, greatest news in the world of enterprise technology. I'm Kurt Franklin, senior analyst at Omnia and your host for this episode of Twiat. You'll notice that I look pretty much nothing like Lou Maresca, our normal host. He's off on assignment. We'll, we'll be back with us shortly. In the meantime, I'm joined by my favorite partner in crime, Mr. Brian Chi. Brian, it's pouring down rain down on this end of uh, the city. Beautiful. What's happening down on your end? I've got all kinds of rumbles overhead. You know, Thor and Zeus are having a great time bowling in the sky. Um, I'm actually doing a little bit of work on trying to figure out how certain things work on the new release of the Raz Raspbian to try and do some more embedded stuff. I'm also building a home-built document cam. Um, back when I was teaching at University of Hawaii, document cams were great so that I could share in large auditoriums. But the problem is they are expensive. And I'm going to be hopefully turning out an Instructable on building a DIY document cam for under $200. Ooh, I like the price point on that. Look forward to uh, seeing what that project brings. Well, we have a great episode for you today. We have a fabulous guest, got some great news, some wonderful sponsors, and I suppose it's time to get started with all of that. Well, in the latest in an ongoing series of third-party attacks, a malicious campaign that researchers are calling Octopus has followed its breach of Twilio and Cloudflare by infiltrating more than 130 other organizations, stealing nearly 10,000 sets of Okta and two-factor authentication credentials from the group. Victims downstream from the original targets include customers like DigitalOcean and DoorDash, among many others. An article on Dark Reading notes that researchers at Group IB describe the campaign as low-tech, involving simple phishing messages telling employees that their password's about to expire and directing them to a malicious website, which captures both existing and new passwords. As an example, the attackers social engineered several Twilio employees into handing over their Okta single sign-on credentials, allowing them to gain access to internal systems, applications, and customer data. The breach then went on to affect about 25 downstream organizations using Twilio's phone verification and other services. Now, in a counterexample of how to limit damage from such an attack, in Cloudflare's case, some employees did in fact fell, fall for the ruse, but the attack was thwarted thanks to the physical security keys required to access all internal applications that are issued to every employee. 
Now, while some observers are using the attacks to question the modern state of identity and access management, others point out that simply following best practices can make a huge difference when the now inevitable supply chain attack comes to pass. Well, big thank you to the folks at Ars Technica for bringing this to my attention. All, if you've been watching the show, you know I like embedded systems and I love Raspberry Pis. And you know I've also been yelling and screaming and soapboxing on how we need better um, firewalls, better intrusion detection systems and so forth. Basically, enterprise-grade security at home. Well... I'm also really happy with Seed Laboratory. That's spelled S-E-E-E-D. So Seed's CM4 router board basically adds two real full-speed gigabit network ports, two USB ports, USB 2.0 ports, and a micro SD sock, an HDMI out, a GPIO interface for the full Raspberry Pi hat add-ons, and a 0.91 inch OLED display onto a Pi CM4. Well, having the CM4 at the system core gives you 32 different options for RAM storage and wireless capabilities on your homebrew router. The router board comes with OpenWRT, OpenWRT installed, but it could run Ubuntu, Raspberry OS, or any other Pi friendly system. Well, the Ars Technical article is quite timely. If you can get the parts in this dismal supply chain and that you can you can build a fairly nice home security gateway like we're going to talk about in bite, Bytes and so forth, we actually talked a lot about it last week. I'd also like to do a big shout out to the folks at Seed Labs about how they're really stepping up to the plate on providing some spectacular sensor systems based on LoRa or long range. Some of their systems could very easily make life a whole lot more interesting for farmers that want to get environmental data out of their distant fields, but couldn't previously afford to use cellular satellite or buried communication cables. I've used the Seed Wio node, spelled W-I-O, with passive infrared detection and temp and humidity sensor feeding to a node red instance running on a Raspberry Pi that then pushed the readings up to a Google spreadsheet. All no code. Anyway, it was to measure building comfort levels and count just how many people were working on the weekends to justify running whole building air conditioning. Well, if you look at your physical perimeter using Hikvision cameras, listen up. As many as 2,300 organizations worldwide, many of them right here in the United States, remain at risk of major compromise via a known critical remote code execution vulnerability in Hikvision IP video cameras, a compromise that was disclosed last year. In an article on Dark Reading, reporter Jay Vizian reminds writes that the bug, designated CVE-2021-36260, is a command injection vulnerability that's present in the web server of many Hikvision cameras. When exploited, it allows attackers to launch commands that allow them to gain complete root shell access to an affected device, something that even the owners don't have, according to the researcher who discovered the flaw. From there, the attacker can move laterally into the rest of the victim's network, gaining access to and persistence on a wide variety of servers and devices. Researchers from CyFirma recently analyzed a sample of 285,000 internet-facing Hikvision cameras and found some 80,000 of them that are still open to exploit via the vulnerability. Hikvision, after being notified of the vulnerability, urged organizations using affected Hikvision cameras to install updated firmware to patch the flaw. Now, CISA has required all federal agencies using the cameras to apply the patch, which Malwarebytes notes is simple enough for someone with reasonable competency and cut and paste to exploit. The lesson, and it keeps on being taught, is to always listen when a vendor tells you to update your firmware and for, by all means, keep your systems up to date. Well, I'll tell you, USA Today 
had this great article. Uh, I managed to pay for my college education um, myself, but that's not the case for the vast majority of people in the United States. And I love this article. So, debt and no degree. Biden cancels as much as 20K in student loan debt. Uh, President Joe Biden said this last Wednesday he'll cancel at least $10,000 in student loan debt for millions of borrowers, giving long-sought relief to Americans saddled with payments and taking a major gamble to energize young voters ahead of the midterm elections. So how much will be forgiven? Up to $20,000 in debt relief for about 7 million low-income Pell Grant recipients, 10 grand for all other borrowers with incomes less than 125000 and from households earning 250000 or less. So according to the article, they're saying up to 43 million borrowers are set to receive some form of relief. Roughly 20 million will have their balances canceled entirely. Corporate America has had mixed re reaction to the president's plan. Some economists have said forgiveness could spark inflation and put pressure on the value of the dollar, a concern the White House is dismissing. Well, this is my spin. What this could mean is a longer-term shift in the American labor force. The number of people entering, entering college is dropping dramatically over the last decade, and most of that can be attributed to their unwillingness to shoulder the increasing tuition and debt load of a modern university. While I agree with people like Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs fame that nothing is wrong with trade schools, I do point out that cybersecurity personnel aren't likely to be created from a trade school, but rather a four-year university. So in my opinion, our shortage of highly skilled labor like cybersecurity specialists could very well start appearing as high school graduates now realize that a university education is finally back within reach. Maybe. While this certainly doesn't have the reach of a free education like in some smaller countries, perhaps longer term, hint, 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 the insane cost of a college education or even a trade school education might someday become a tax write-off. Well, that's it for the blips. We've got a lot more to come, including one or more bites and a fabulous guest. Before we get there, though, we have to see what our great master host, Lou Maruska, has been up to because he has a fabulous sponsor to tell us about. Lou, over to you. Well, thank you, guys. We'll get you back to your enterprise and IT news in just one moment. But before we do, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's userway.org. Now, every website without exception needs to be accessible. Now, Userway's incredible AI-powered solution tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines that are out there. And in a matter of seconds, Userway AI can achieve more than an entire team of developers can in months. Now, at first, it may seem overwhelming to make your website accessible, but UserWay solutions make it simple, easy, and cost effective. You can even use their free scanning tool to see if your website's ADA compliant. Now, if you have an enterprise level website with thousands of pages out there, UserWay offers a managed solution where their team can handle everything for you. UserWay's AI and machine learning solutions power accessibility for over a million websites trusted by Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx, and many more leading brands out there. Now, UserWay is making its best-in-class enterprise-level accessibility tools available to small and medium businesses as well. You can get started today for as little as $49 a month on UserWay's monthly plan. Your company can be ADA compliant, reach more customers, and even build customer loyalty. And remember, you'll get 30% off. There are a billion people in the world with disabilities. That's roughly 13% of the population. You don't want to lose as potential customers because you're not compliant. Think about it. By not being compliant, fines and revenue loss will cost you so much more. UserWay is the leading accessibility solution in the market today with a market share of 61%, biggest in the world. For years, UserWay has been on the cutting edge, creating innovative accessibility technologies that really push the envelope of what's possible with AI, machine learning, and computer vision. UserWay's AI automatically fixes violations at the code level, and here's some of the things they can actually do. It auto-generates image alts, really makes it easy. It writes image descriptions for you, remediates complex nav menus, and ensures that all pop-ups 
are accessible. It fixes vague link violations and even broken links and ensures your website makes use of accessible colors while remaining true to your brand. And UserWay gives you a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website. UserWay is platform agnostic and it integrates seamlessly, seamlessly with WordPress, Shopify, Wix, Sitecore, SharePoint, and many more out there. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. The voice of Siri, Susan Bennett, has a message about UserWay. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. Go to userway.org slash twit and get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. Book a short call and get their accessibility guide. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Visit userway.org slash twit today. And we thank UserWay for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Back to you guys. Thanks, Lou. We appreciate that. And we'll be hearing more from Lou in just a bit. Before that, though, it's time for a bite. And this one, well, it's something that's becoming more and more important as time goes on. Because it turns out that a lot of companies are going to a multi-cloud architecture and writing that architecture into the land of unknowingness. According to the Cloud Security Alliance's 2021 report, which they call State of the Cloud Security Concerns, Challenges, and Incidents, 41% of the people who responded were unsure whether they had experienced a cloud security incident in the recent year. That's double the percentage since 2019 and an astounding number. Now, imagine if someone came up to you and asked if you had a break-in at your house. They go to 100 people in your area and over 40% of them say, I don't know. But that's the situation with multi-cloud. And for a growing number of organizations, multi-cloud is the default when it comes to application architecture. When I was at AWS's reinforce conference in Boston earlier this summer, multi-cloud was talked about a great deal because even the people at AWS, someone who you could say has a vested interest in keeping people on a single cloud environment, recognize that multi-cloud is the way most of their customers are going to build their applications. Now, in spite of everything that we've done in terms of developing tools and practices for security, consistent data protection and privacy is very difficult in diverse environments, even though, or perhaps especially because, each of those environments is likely to have their very own security tools. The problem is twofold. First, visibility. Knowing what you have and knowing how it's acting. Now, this seems like a very simple thing, but in fact, it's very, very difficult for most organizations. At the Black Hat conference a couple of weeks ago, visibility was one of the words that was on practically every booth sign because so many customers are trying to figure out just precisely what they have in their environment, and how it's configured. Now, this is followed by the issue of control. And let's begin by stating the obvious. You can't control what you don't know you have. This is critically important for a lot of companies, and it's made even more important by the fact that so many regulations 
and so many laws across multiple jurisdictions require any organization that collects and possesses data to be able to not just keep it secure and keep the private information of their customers secure and private, but to be able to prove that they're doing that. How can you prove compliance with regulations if you don't know what is in your environment? Now, there are a lot of companies out there that are trying to provide pieces to solve this puzzle. You see lots of organizations providing solutions that say that they provide visibility. Some of them provide visibility and control, visibility and management, visibility and security, but all comes back to visibility, knowing what you have in your environment. You know, one of the things I hear over and over and over again is that a CIO or a CISO probably has a really good idea of what their environment looks like on the day it's deployed. Once you get deployment plus one day, the certainty about what that environment and architecture looks like starts to get less and less and less. This is a problem, and it's a bigger problem because threat actors tend to be willing to put the time in to do reconnaissance so that they do know what your environment looks like. And the moment a threat actor knows more about the state of your architecture than you do, you've just crossed the line into exceptional vulnerability. Now, Brian, I, I want to talk to you because you and I have each encountered an awful lot of tools that go out and say that they will provide an inventory, say that they'll look at your environment and come back and tell you what's there. With all of these tools and with everyone pretty much admitting that this is a problem, why do we have so much trouble just knowing what makes up our architecture? I think the base problem is time pressures. We've got way too many people saying, you got to get it done by next week without knowing what the problem is, without knowing what the tools are capable of doing. Um, you and I have done many, 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 many shootouts where we've done competitive product reviews. <clears throat> problem is, they're gone. Uh, we couldn't sell enough ads to make it worthwhile for the magazine we both work for, and we we're both pink slipped. Well, here's the loss. By losing competitive product reviews, it shifts the onus to the people that are deploying them to figure out what the limits of those tools are. You know, face it, not all clouds are built alike. And if you aren't taking the time or the effort to test drive your apps. You know, whip out that corporate credit card and try it. See if it'll work. You know, we've had a great comment from Doug M. in the uh, chat room about multi-cloud is the only way today. Every SaaS app on a different cloud infrastructure and so forth. <clears throat> lots and lots of people are testing but all too many people aren't. They're believing the salespeople. You know, some salespeople have been great. You know, I, I love them dearly, but they're in to make some money. So they're going to try and convince you and Silver Tongue is going to do their best job of convincing you, jump right in, the water's fine. Well, have you tried it first? Because... How do you know that your apps are going to work? Maybe the water is full of piranhas. Anyway, <clears throat> so folks, <clears throat> don't believe the salespeople. Use that as a roadmap. Try it out yourself. Because a multi-cloud environment, just because your SaaS app runs beautifully on Google doesn't mean it's going to be run beautifully on AWS or Azure or whatever. 
try it. Run it through, through some tests. Use some of the um, web load type applications out there to go and create some artificial traffic on your apps to make sure that it actually will scale at least a little bit. Um, try it. Don't just buy, you know, this giant, super expensive platform. You know, like you won't just buy a car. You'll test drive it first. Same thing goes for your cloud apps. <clears throat> Well, one of the things that we're finding is that in addition to everything else that's going on, there's this whole notion of alert overload. You know, when you've got so many different clouds, and, and even if you're only going with the three majors, AWS, Google, Microsoft, if you have pieces from those three all generating alerts, if you have pieces of those three all being part of a single application, and then you have all of the additional connectors, services, micro applications that combine to make a modern application, it can be difficult to know where everything's coming from, difficult to prioritize it, and often almost impossible to have a single screen. You know, that's the holy grail these days. Companies really would like what they call a single pane of glass that gives them the picture of how their application and architecture security is working. And that single pane of glass is something that I find essentially no company will guarantee you. Now, this, this is good news because it means that the providers of visibility and security and management software are admitting that there are limits to just what they can see, ingest, analyze, and display. So that's good. The bad news is that it makes things far more complicated than we would like them to be. Now, what's the solution for this? What a great question. Uh, ultimately, a company is going to have to depend on their partners to help them figure out how to build a, uh, an inventory, visibility, management, and security platform that matches and fits their application delivery platform. Until that magical moment occurs, though, just be careful out there. It's a tough, complicated world, and it doesn't look like it's getting any simpler anytime soon. Well, that's going to do it for our bite today. We've got a superb guest coming up with a lot of great information before we can talk to our guests, though, it's time to go back and hear from Lou Maresca one more time, telling us about an incredible Twyat sponsor. Well, thank you, guys. That will get you back to your enterprise and IT news in just a moment. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Thanks Canary. If there's anything we've learned from this last year is that companies must make it a priority to layer the security of their networks. We talk about it all the time. One of these layers needs to be Thinks Canary. Unfortunately, companies usually find out too late that they've actually been compromised, even after they've already spent millions of dollars on IT security. Attackers are sneaky. That's right. They, they hide from companies. They prowl on the networks looking for that valuable data. But the great thing about Canary is that they've turned this into an advantage for you. While attackers browse Active Directory for file servers and explore file shares, they'll be looking for documents, They'll try to default passwords against network devices and web services, and they'll scan for open services across the network. Now, Things Canaries are designed to look like the things that hackers want to get to. Canaries can be deployed throughout your entire network, and you can make them look identical, identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, or a Windows server, so attackers won't know 
they've been actually caught. You can even put fake files on them and name them in ways that get the hacker's attention. Now you can enroll them in Active Directory even, and when attackers investigate further, they give themselves away and you're instantly notified. Now, Canary tokens act as tiny little tripwires that you can drop into hundreds of places. A canary is designed to be installed and configured in minutes, and you won't have to think about them again. Now, if an alert happens, Canary will notify you any way you want. In fact, you can get alerts by email or text message right there on the console through Slack or webhooks, even syslog, or even their API. Now, data breaches happen typically through your staff, and when they do, companies often don't know they've been compromised. It takes an average of 191 days for a company to realize that there's been a data breach. Canary solves that problem. Now, Canary was created by people who've trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks. And with that knowledge, they've built Canaries. Now, you'll find Canaries deployed all over the world and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit, and for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrade support, and maintenance. And if you use code TWIT in the How to Hear About Us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your Thanks Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit. And enter the code TWIT in the How to Hear About Us box. And we thank Thanks Canary for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Back to you guys. Thanks, Lou. We appreciate that. And now it's time for, well, the best part of any episode of Twyatt, our guest. This week, we have Patrick Jean, CTO of Out Systems. Patrick, welcome to Twyatt. Kurt, thanks for having me. Now, before we get into the heart of what Out Systems is and does, our listeners really love it when our guests can talk about how they arrived in their current position. So can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to be sitting in the CTO's chair at our systems? Uh, yeah, I think my uh, my story starts probably when I was about 12 years old and uh, just classic, uh, classic geek, you know, kid got a home computer um, introduced to I think it was like some basic uh, language that was on the computer started started basically reproducing, I think, like Lunar Lander or some game like that, you know, and I, I was hooked ever since on technology. Um, and getting into out systems for me was, was a little bit of a dream job. So combining software development, fixing problems with software development and cloud, which is something that uh, I've been doing for kind of ever since there was cloud, really able to pull that together into the CTO job. And uh, it's a fun ride. Well, it, it sounds like it, and I want to talk about OutSystems because uh, I started out in the computer world doing compiler design and uh, language theory. So tell me about what it is that OutSystems is doing and a little bit about how it happens. Yeah, for sure. This will be very interesting for you then. So we we really uh, exist to tackle that some of the problems that you're that get manifested from what you're talking about with compilers and design and software development. So if you think about the last, I mean, really, it's been 30, 40 years of software development. The addition of more and more technology has been a great opportunity for developers, but it has also come with a significant cost and its complexity. And so we really exist as a company to to tackle the, the kind of the two headed monster of change and, and complexity. And so we started out knowing that change in software development is something that you must um, you must always plan for. And that complexity will keep increasing over time. And if you think about modern developers today, I mean, you're you're basically given this amazing just kind of smorgasbord of technology you can use, you know, to go build an application. But then the problem is you're giving all this technology to use and you got to figure out how to do it. I mean, it's like, what's the mobile framework if you're writing a mobile app? You know, what's the back end data store? You know, how are you going to secure your APIs? What cloud are you going to use? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so 
it's daunting, uh, it's exciting, but uh, it's too challenging. And if you think about the number of software projects that have failed 20, 30 years ago, percentage wise, it's kind of about the same today. So while we've increased all these capabilities in software development, we still have a significant uh, failure rate and failure measured by projects that are too late, come in without the necessary requirements, they cost way too much. You know, we continue to have some of these same problems. And so OutSystems exists to solve that complexity and change problem. Well, now I'm curious because what you were describing there makes it sound like many of the users of your system are going to be on the software development team at an organization. I know that there are a lot of other low code and no code options that like to say that they're in place so that subject matter experts, the business units can do software development. You know, where do you come down? Do you really see most of the people who have hands on with your product being developers who are going to turn to your system rather than sitting down with uh, C++ or Java or, or some other language? Yeah, we see both actually. So we're we're kind of in a, a unique spot as far as in um, low code, no code. And there's there's some great companies out there in low code, no code space. Like you said, some of them veer way to the side of you know no development experience. You know, just go piece applications together. Some all the way back to the point of um, it's still a you know what you think of a traditional development um, organization. I believe we have to uh, we have to serve both of those. And so I think of really two groups of people. And uh, if you kind of start breaking it down, there is what uh, I would like to call career developers. I don't like the term professional developers because that kind of assumes all the other people are not professional or unprofessional. <laughs> you know, so you have career developers and that's someone who you go look at their resume and on their resume, what they list is their software developer. You know, they they're basically that's their craft. And then there's a group of people that it's kind of been used the term of citizen developers. So developers that they don't look at development as a career that they're going to, you know, go through and master skills around it. Development is a means to an end for them. And for really both career and citizen developers, the end result is an application in the hands of users, you know, and creating a delightful experience, you know, providing business value. But there is a very different path for both of those. And OutSystems um, really actually is a, a tool for both. I think we're definitely much more of a tool for the per, what's called the professional developer, what I like to call a career developer, um, that can get in and do big, large-scale applications with us. And that's kind of where we differentiate is the large-scale application. And there's, there's some good tools that are out there in the low-code space along with us that are getting more and more serious about this. And so... That was, there's been a stigma. I mean, it'd be very you know clear. I don't even like the term uh, low code. I mean, it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit derogatory, right? As a developer, you're like, hey, that low code. I don't I don't need something low. Um, and so I think that that stigma is going away because platforms like ours can produce very large scale apps that millions of end users can um, can basically use without all of this undifferentiated heavy lifting that developers have had to deal with, you know, for many, many years. I've done, I mean, ever since, like I said, 12 year old kid, and then, you know, developing more. And every time I'd get to a larger app, it was cool, right? Getting in all this technology is cool, but then you realize the complexity actually increases risk. And uh, yeah, I can't tell you how many, how many projects early in my career are failures, you know, for months of development. And then you get to the end, you can't get it over the finish line because of, I mean, bad mistakes that we made, you know, and it was almost always due to complexity and not handling the change of software development. I don't know. I, I think that depriving people of the sheer joy of uh, 2 a.m. errors when they can't do they get their <laughs> link strings uh, right uh, is, is probably a, a cruelty in and of itself. But yeah. one of the things I notice is that you, you seem to very consciously use the term low code. Other companies consciously use no code. Do you see yes. that as being an important distinction? Yes, very much so. And I think most of the, and look, we're still shaking it out as far as in the industry, right? And what these monikers mean. I think the most of the no-code players 
basically say, look, you can't pierce that veil of uh, of the what's called the development platform. You can't get behind the scenes and, um, you know, get in there and make significant changes. With us, we say, look, I, we believe that 90 plus percent of what you need to do that you can do using our visual development tools. And so those, you know, that have used out systems and downloaded service studio, it's an integrated development environment. It's a very visual interface, you know, um, as far as the development process. But if there's something that you can't do with ours, then you can go in and use code to extend it. And so we're very big on extensibility. That's why for us, I mean, low code is a, is a, um, it's a good name, you know, to actually people can understand it in, uh, in that sense. And uh, that's how we differentiate. You know, you can, as a professional developer, get in and use it. And but a lot of, I mean, if you think about it, for those, you know, I'm I'm not a front end developer. Okay, I, when I when I got into development, I like the back end. You know, as far as the, the databases and you know, before even it was REST APIs and you know, handling as far as communication between services. I mean, I, I, I like that. Then I struggled on the front end side. Um, for us, you know, you can be a full stack developer get into the areas that you want to get deeper in. You know, if you're more of the backend developer, get in more of that hard code backend development and then create beautiful front end interfaces without having to understand, you know, any any of the frameworks, you know, React, you know, Angular, if you're still using Angular, you know, um, mobile, right? If you need to uh, flood or things like that, you don't have to understand all those. You don't even have to, to go in and try and learn that, right? You can create a beautiful front end and then focus or vice versa. You know, and so you can really focus on what you want, dig in deeper where you want to dig in deeper and not. And I think that's why we do appeal to um, to more of the what I call career developers. It's just we just need to get over that stigma of like low code means that somehow you're not capable. No, it's not that you're not capable. It's just that you want to get time. I, I don't want to be a, I, I'll, I'll be frank. I don't want to be up at 2 a.m., you know, handling all these issues. Or I don't want to be working like, you know, 80 hours, 70, 80 hours a week to try and get this thing over the hump. You know, because you didn't, it was so complex, you couldn't uh, estimate the time, right? And, then, you know, we've, we've all probably been there, right? We've committed to some date internally and uh, and then you're going to try and hit that date, but it means you're working like an insane number of hours. So we're really, it's one of the things that we do is, it's interesting. We've actually had some really emotional testimonials from developers that have used our platform that said that, that we basically saved their career as a developer, that uh, they were, they were going to leave development altogether. And then they found us and uh, it's made it, you know, a much more enjoyable experience. Yeah, that's very cool because I, I know and I have to admit to to my shame that as I've gone along and gained more experience in life, I've been a little bit uh, less excited about these, you know, 36 hours marathon coding sessions. Uh, the, the sort of thing that uh, actually sort of excited me when I was in my 20s just doesn't anymore. Yeah. It's it's amazing how that works. Now, it is. <laughs> one th- <laughs> now, with a lot of, of systems similar to yours, at least in appearance, uh, low code, no code, mm-hmm. it seems that every time an application is executed, it has to go and basically involve the backend system that the vendor has put in place. So it's an interpreted language that's going through a couple of layers of interpretation every time that code is is accessed. And people have pointed out that that is a performance issue in many cases and a security issue in some. So, you know, is that the way that yours works? And if it is, then how do you get around these performance and security issues? Yeah, we don't work that way, and uh, and I do believe that that's not the best way. I mean, there are there are some um, there are some of the tools in the industry that go about that more interpretive way. We are, we're fully compiled, and so what we do at the point of change. So, kind of talked about a little bit earlier about change is is one of the big things we tackle. At the actual point of change, without systems, when you make any change, whether it's a, on a screen, whether it's a say a database field, um, whether it's some type of a flow, logic flow, whatever it is. We capture that change and we store the um, the application representation in a graph. So we call it an application model graph. So that's actually at the point of change. So you talk about a little bit before about compilers and parsers. 
if you think about some of the modern, um, more traditional development as far as languages, they'll eventually build out these abstract syntax trees, you know, and there's some of the IDEs are actually getting, um, they're getting better at this where they're doing it more on demand. And so it's interesting how getting to this um, graph based representation of the application is what we're, we do immediately. Some of the others obviously do it at compile time. Um, and then they're doing a kind of some pre compile capabilities up front. But we take that um, we take that graph and then we compile it and then it actually comes into binary code. So the out the output of our platform, our development platform, looks like what a um, good modern cloud native full stack development team would actually put out. You know, and so we can host it in VMs, we can host it in containers. Um, but you're going to get you know we do a uh, compilation to we actually do a transpile technically to C sharp, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, uh, SQL as far as on the back end, some type of a SQL, we support multiple database uh, back ends. And then we'll compile that into binaries that will actually get deployed out. And so we have the benefit of both worlds. One is that you get that performance and a much higher security uh, posture, because then you can also use, you can also use all the security tools as far as for static code analysis. You can do runtime analysis. You can do all those things that uh, that are out there for good traditional development, and actually use them on the applications uh, built with our platform. But you get all that speed of us having this visual development environment that handles change at the point of change, and then all the ramifications. Um, you know, it also gets into DevOps and and the whole. What I like to say is DevOps is a solution to a problem we shouldn't have. You know, we kind of do away with the concept of the need for DevOps because if we handle that change early on instead of pushing, kicking the can down the road. You know, so we definitely, to answer long-winded answer to your question, no, we're, we're not interpreted. Uh, we don't believe that's the right way. We do believe that we should compile in and just have a modern cloud-native stack, which is what we do. I'm intrigued by the idea of the end of DevOps, but before we can get there and to <laughs> a lot more, it's time to hear from Lou Maresca one more time because we've got yet another great sponsor of Twiat to tell you about. Well, thank you guys. We'll get you back to your guests in just a moment. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's IRL, Original Podcast. From Mozilla. Now, IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. Now, hosted by Bridget Todd, this season of IRL looks at AI in real life. Who can AI help and who can it harm? The show features fascinating conversations with people who are working to build more trustworthy AI. For example, there's an episode about how our world is mapped with AI. Now, the data that's missing from those maps tells as much of a story as the maps themselves, though you hear all about the people who are working to fill in those gaps and take control of the data. Now, there's another episode about gig workers who depend on apps for their livelihood. It looks at how they are pushing back against algorithms that control how much they get paid and seeking new ways to gain power over data to create better working conditions. For political junkies, there's an episode about the role that AI plays when it comes to the spread of misinformation and hate speech around elections and huge concern for democracies around the world. Now, I really like season four, episode one, checking out online shopping. Now they actually talk about the hidden costs of shopping online and what you're actually giving up. Now, Meta Brown, a data scientist from Amazon is on the show and talks about what happens when you actually make an online purchase. It may actually shock you. Super compelling episode, definitely check it out. Search for IRL in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to IRL for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, thanks so much, Lou. I appreciate it. We're back talking with Patrick Jean, CTO of OutSystems, and it's time for me to bring in my co-host, Brian Chi. Brian, I know that you probably have more experience in low-code environments than I do, and I have the strangest feeling you've got a whole pile of great questions that you're just itching to ask. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, um... I actually helped build a uh, old system back in, I don't know, I think it was back in the late 80s of um, doing touch tone and web registration systems using low code solutions. Well, 
low-code, no-code solutions have changed radically over the years. And the biggest problem I'm hearing from people are when you have to go hybrid. Um, regardless of how good the tools are, stovepipe solutions still exist. And my question is, do you have tools to help people work in a hybrid environment? Yeah, that's definitely one of the areas that we actually have targeted and said that, look, this is something that's a challenge. And so if you think about the stovepipe or monolith or whatever you want to, you know, call that hard system to kind of crack, you know, that's really isolated and tries to kind of keep everything together. We go through and let companies really use, you know, what you think of as strangler pattern, right? If you kind of from a development standpoint is just chip away at it and um, you can, you know, very common, you know, REST API type of integration as far as that we use. You can connect at the data source level. Um, even if you want to just go straight to database connectivity, we have uh, companies that do that as well. Many different ways you can integrate. Um, we have a very robust community that build components. We call it Forge, um, where you can go build components. A lot of them are integration components that companies can use. And then chip away at that um uh, as far as it's some of the functionality that are in these legacy systems. Uh, we replace, you know, cobalt-based systems, uh, AS400 mainframe, you know, piece by piece. And, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I've never, well, I probably was early in my career, let me, let me back up, but I'm not a uh, proponent of like a big bang approach, you know, to go in and, and try and just uh, replace everything. For us, let's go try it out, go look at something that's been a very difficult problem to do. And maybe it's, maybe it's actually just a, a, um, a great UX in front of a backend legacy system, you know, could even still be old green screen systems, you know, that exist. And then what we'll have companies do is literally we'll put a, um, a good, highly usable front end in that system and leave everything else back there, you know, and connect to it. And then, but then maybe start uh, piece by piece replacing the back end as well, you know? And so um, we, that's a very common as far as strategy for our customers. Cool. Well, since we're on the topic of UX and user interfaces, your system, descri your website describes that you're platform flexible. So what happens if you have a company that needs to be able to deploy to lots of different user front ends like Android, iPhone, iPad, web, Windows, Mac, Chrome, and so forth? Do you have to write or build multiple versions for each platform? Or does your system allow you to say, I want these? Yeah, you can do you could do both. And we have uh, customers that basically build. So if you think of it like a responsive app, you could basically take and build one responsive app that would handle all those form factors. They could be deployed. Um, we have a thing called a mobile app build service as far as that could take and build out to a mobile target. That'd be Android and iOS. You could also host that same app. Um, you know, it could be an app. Uh, it could be, a, I'm sorry, on a tablet. You know, it could be web or it could be an app on the tablet as well. Um, you could, and then you could also load that up as far as in a browser, any of the browsers. Um, you could also take and do the back end, so maybe like the database and the APIs and things like that, and then create um, front ends that are specific to each device format if there was a need to, you know. And so you actually can do either one. And that's kind of goes back to that flexibility of uh, the, you know, high code or traditional or career developer that likes that control. You can do it. But if you just want to go in and do a, could be just a PWA as well, right? Just go write a PWA and uh, deploy it out. You basically write it w once and deploy it to all these form factors. Uh, we allow that as well. And um, cool. because once kind of going through how we do that compilation, you know, process, um, you're just basically writing it one time. You're storing it at one time and then we can choose how to deploy it out, you know, uh, downstream. Well, speaking of downstream, what happens if all of a sudden we open up, say, a European branch. Now, all of a sudden, we, our old apps now have a GDPR or HIPAA or FISMA requirement. Can I still go back and say, hey, I've got new requirements. Do I have to rewrite everything or can I just say go? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, GDPR, I mean, all, all the compliance side is a, it's an interesting category, right? Um, but I mean, we absolutely support as far as GDPR from uh, that process. We're I think we're actually considered. You're gonna you're gonna test my compliance uh, compliance skills here. I think it's a, a data processor on the GDPR side, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, if you think about us hosting, so we it's, and actually I'm getting into the point where we host the cloud 
we actually have the out systems cloud. So we actually will do a full end to end hosting of the development platform and the runtime. Customers could also take it and host it themselves, right? And so then we're not even involved in it. So then GDPR and issues like that, that's basically, you would handle that as your own, but you know, kind of talk in the context about systems cloud. Uh, we absolutely support that. You know, we've got a HIPAA offering, got a PCI offering. Um, you know, we're, that is actually an area that we're, we try and be friendly to IT, if you want to think of it that way. Um, some of the low code, no code solutions out there, almost are a get around IT. I'm not a fan of that. I've, you know, I've been in IT, you know, for quite a few years and I understand the challenges as far as IT. We look at as being a friend of IT, a friend of business, a friend of the developer. And we try and make sure that uh, we can handle all those. And so on the compliance side, we work real hard to make sure that we handle, you know, all the different certifications and attestations that are uh, important for our customers. And then also given just good process and how you go about um, deploying applications. You know, you can do things such as, as a developer, I can write the application, but, and I can deploy it to say development and, uh, and staging, but then I can't deploy it to production. And then someone, maybe an IT, if I'm not, you know, a dedicated system administrator in IT is the only one that could deploy to production with our, uh, with our services. So we try and really handle that side, which I think a lot of the low code, no code players don't, you know, address, uh, because we do understand the complexity and the need to be, uh, to support all of this from a compliance standpoint. Well, my last question custom connectors. That seems to be the Achilles heel of a lot of the no-code, low-code solutions out there. How do you deal with something that isn't on your connector list? Yeah. So for us, like I said, we, so think of it, the database side, um, we support as far as SQL, Oracle, uh, DB2, um, you know, basically it's out of the box and MySQL out of the box. Uh, with our latest iteration with Neo, we also support Postgres um, on AWS. And then, if you want, you can you can actually write your own database connector with the database SDK. Um, we have a tool called Integration Builder that will allow you to integrate into other services. You can do it at the database level. You could do it at the um, say like an API or SOAP. I mean, there's a lot of legacy systems out there that still use SOAP to connect. So it's a very um, kind of straightforward process to do it. And going back to that question of like, hey, the, the complexity between the, the career developer and a citizen developer, you could have someone that understands more the back end system go create the wrapper around this connectivity. And then they just get exposed up as very consumable low code endpoints. And then you have maybe a more of an analyst type that's in the environment that they could just plug in, connect to all these things and you know create some business logic around it. So. For us, we try and create that fusion team. You'll hear that term approach where you got people more technical, dig in on the back end side, get to all these connectors, these systems, and then make them consumable um, in a nice, friendly way by uh, more of a citizen developer. You know, if you want to think of it that way, that we use a system that doesn't understand all the back end stuff, and they don't need to. You know, and so um, once again, it's another place that we shine on that. And I think it, you have look you. If you can't access data in the enterprise, if you can't manipulate data in the enterprise, you know, you're not going to be a, a, uh, a tool that most companies are going to want to use. And so you have to be able to access all of this data that's out there and do it in a, in a very user friendly way. You know? Well, we've been with Patrick, Gene, CTO of OutSystems, and unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Before we leave, though, Patrick, I want to ask if someone is interested in learning about OutSystems or even trying their hand with your development tools, how do they get started? Yeah, the easiest way is go to OutSystems.com. I mean, there's a, there's a little button in the top right corner that says Start Free. And, uh, and you click that button and just within a few minutes, you literally will have a, a development tool, an integrated development environment. You will be connected to a backend cloud environment where you can build an application. And there's, not, there's this nice little one click publish button that just publishes the app and you'll actually see it running. I mean, this is literally just within a few minutes. So uh, just go try it. That's the easiest way. Try it. That's the easiest way. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Well, we also appreciate you 
our faithful viewers and listeners, uh, thanks for being with us. Before we head off into the somewhat thundery uh, sunset here in Florida, though, got to ask my co-host, Brian, what's what's on your agenda for the coming week? Where can people find you and everything you're doing? Well, I'm going to show this new toy. It's an ESP32, so it's basically a mini Android machine. There's a micro SD card slot in the top. I'm modifying the code. It basically plays um, an HTML webcam, but by changing the code, I can change it into something. I want to be able to do interval photography. Um, I'm going to stick a battery on this and I want to stick it way up in the rafters so we can actually take a picture, say once a minute and watch the Maker Faire being built. So it ought to be fun. And the cool thing is I bought this off Amazon, and this was under $40. And it's a pretty decent little camera. And um, it uses so little um, energy. In fact, when it goes into sleep mode, it's only uh, 12 milliamps. So I should be able to put a fairly good-sized battery on that and not have to change the battery through the entire Maker Faire, which ought to be a lot of fun. I like the idea of not having to put you up on a uh, forklift on a regular basis just to change out the battery. That, that's a very good thing. Well, as for me, you can always find me on Twitter at KG4GWA. I'm also going to be writing more at Dark Reading. Go to Dark Reading slash Omdia. And uh, for those who are subscribers, you'll see my writing at Omdia.com. Well, as I said, we really appreciate you being here because we could not and most likely wouldn't do this without you, the Twiat Riot. So thank you for that. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, whenever you want to know about what's happening in the world of enterprise technology, well, just keep Twiat. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash clubtwit. And thanks for your support.